see uh, the economy has worn me down. <laughs> uh, I don't know how many of you know that uh, Andres uh, was my student. Did you already tell them that? Did you tell them that I gave you an A? No. He got an A. Now what he doesn't know is that I gave every student an A. <laughs> Talking about self-esteem. You never gave me an A. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about uh, inequality, uh, which is uh, affecting all of our nations. And in a relatively short amount of time, I want to talk to you about why it is happening, what it means, why we should be concerned about it, uh, and what we can do about it. Okay? Uh, number one, what we see in the United States, in Mexico, in Europe, uh, all across the world is that if you are well educated and you are well connected, it's not just education, it's also connections, and I'll get to that in a minute. If you're well educated and well connected, uh, you are doing very well. In fact, you're doing better and better than ever. Uh, in the United States uh, right now, uh, the people who are at the top, who are the biggest earners in the United States, uh, are enjoying a larger share of the total income of the country uh, than ever before. In fact, as far as we can measure, not since the 1880s and 1890s uh, have people who are that wealthy got that much income and that much wealth. Uh, in the United States, the 400 wealthiest people have as much wealth as the bottom 150 Americans put together. Uh, in the world, though, you see a very similar pattern. Uh, in the world, according to uh, a study that just came out, the 85 richest people in the world have together as much wealth as the bottom half of the world population put together. Uh, now, why is this happening, uh, and is it a problem? Well, it's happening largely because of two things. One is called globalization. Now that's an overused term. Rarely has a term gone so directly from meaninglessness to uh, obscurity uh, as globalization without any intervening period of coherence. Uh, what I mean by globalization is not just trade. It is also direct investment. Uh, it is uh, all sorts of, well, let me give you an example. It's, everything is coming from everywhere. Uh, I was Secretary of Labor in the United States, and when I was Secretary of Labor, uh, my family needed a new car. And so we went to a local uh, Toyota dealer in Washington, and we found a car that perfectly met our family's interests. Uh, and then I got back to the office, didn't buy the car yet, uh, but uh, I told some of my uh, people in my office that I was going to buy a Toyota, and they were very upset. They said, Mr. Secretary, may we remind you, you are Secretary of Labor of the United States. You should not buy a Japanese car. Uh, and I, the next weekend, I understood their point entirely. Uh, politically, it would not look good. So the next weekend, uh, my wife and I went to a Ford dealership. And I said to the Ford dealer, uh, now I know that that is a Ford nameplate on the, on the wall, uh, but you must answer my question, and I want you to answer it truthfully. Was this car made here in the United States by American workers, or was it made not by American workers? And he looked at me for a long instant, trying to decide, was I one of those? Or was I one of those? And finally, he looked up with a smile, and he said, which would you prefer? <laughs> because you see, everything is being made everywhere. The Toyota is being made all over the world. The parts are coming from all over the world. The Ford is being made all over the world. The parts are coming from everywhere. Uh, it's no longer meaningful to talk about national products as such. The standard of living of people in Mexico or in Puebla or in California where I live uh, or in Europe 
uh, or in any particular area of the globe, the standard of living depends less and less on the profitability of companies who are there, and more and more on the value added by the people who live there, value added to the increasingly integrated global economy. Now, when I say that, sometimes people get nervous, and I say, well, how is it that we are going to have good jobs in the future? Because there's always going to be some place where wages are cheaper. Mexican wages are low, but Mexican wages are much higher than wages in Southeast Asia. Won't everything be made in places like Indonesia, or in Pakistan, or wherever, or in Bangladesh? And the answer is no, and this is incredibly important to understand. It is not just wages that determine where things are made and where components are produced. It is value added and productivity. Uh, another example, let me give you another example. My hips, I had to have both of my hips replaced. Uh, my new hips are beautiful. I can't show them to you, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me just assure you that they are beautiful new hips. Uh, the question is, uh, where were my beautiful new hips made? I went back to the hospital where they were installed. I asked them, it turns out my beautiful new hips were fabricated not in Southeast Asia, not uh, in a, a place that's very, that is very low wages. No, my new hips were made in Germany. The median wage in Germany is higher than the median wage in the United States. Why is it my beautiful new hips were made in Germany? Because of precision manufacturing. Because the Germans have an extraordinary capacity to do very high technological work. <laughs> Did I say something wrong? Are you German? <laughs> And, 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 and what I want you to understand is that there is a lesson there, and that is that uh, the issue is value added. The issue is productivity. It is not where things are made. It is not how low wages are. Uh, Mexico, the Mexican economy, will not do better and better by having lower and lower wages or having fewer and fewer uh, regulations and making it less and less safe. No, the economy of Mexico, the economy of the United States, does better if we have better educated people, people who can add more value. And therein lies the dilemma, therein lies the problem. Because in a global economy and a high technology economy, that's the second big issue is technological change. When you have globalization and technological change, in your country, the people who are well-educated and well-connected, they are going to do better and better. They're on the winning side of the great divide. The people who don't have that education, don't have those connections, are losing out. And that's why you're seeing widening inequality in every nation in the world. The challenge in the United States, as it is a challenge in Mexico, is to provide everybody, everybody, with a high quality education, not just a few. And let me go on to talk about what that means. Because too often, I believe, and again, I'm talking about North America as a whole, and even when I am in Europe and I examine European educational systems, I see the same thing. Too often, when we talk about education, it is a matter of facts. It's a matter of learning to follow rules. It's a matter of uh, people who are sitting there in classrooms simply absorbing concepts. That is not an education of a sort that is going to lead to high value added in the future. We have got to educate students to think. We've got to educate students to solve problems. We've got to educate students to work in teams. We've got to educate students to recognize patterns. In other words, the economy of the future is not going to be an economy in which we have large numbers of people who simply need to follow directions. That's the old factory system. 
That factory system is disappearing. The economy of the future is an economy in which more and more people have got to, if they can't be totally creative, obviously we cannot have an entire nation or nations in which everybody is an inventor, but they've got to think more for themselves and in groups. They've got to identify problems as well as solve problems. That means more and better public investment in education. It means making good education accessible to everyone. This should not be politically complicated, and it should not be a political issue. Now, sitting over there is Stephen Moore. Stephen Moore and I have spent the last 10 years <laughs> on television in the United States yelling at each other. <laughs> no, that's not true. We don't yell. We're good friends. Uh, Stephen has the unfortunate... Uh, how can I say this, Steve? <laughs> delicately. <laughs> I'll say it delicately. Uh, the unfortunate position to be uh, a, let's call him, a conservative Republican. <laughs> is, that, is, that a, is, that, is that a fair characterization? It's free market Republican. Yes, that's fair. Uh, now, right now in America, and I, I, I know a little bit about what it is in Mexico and Mexican politics, right now in the, in the United States, the Democrats and the Republicans are at loggerheads. Everybody is yelling at everybody. That's the way it's been for a number of years now. And as you know, we had an election uh, just uh, not that many days ago, and the Republicans took over the, not only the House of Representatives, but also the Senate. So Steve's party is doing pretty well. But the issues that I've just been talking about in terms of competitiveness, inequality, the central importance of education, these should not be issues that are either liberal or conservative issues, democratic or republican issues. Here in Mexico, people need to get together to understand. Education is our future. Our children is our future. Uh, now, I know many of you are hungry. Anybody hungry? <laughs> yes. So we're not going to keep this going very much longer, but we do want to have a little bit of a discussion, a little bit of a debate, and if there's time, get you involved as well. Okay. Well, th thank you, Bob. Um, fantastic. Um, privileged to be here in Puebla. Um, what a beautiful city and beautiful people you have. So thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, you know, Bob Reich and I have been debating, as he said, for about 10 years on economics. I have a more free market oriented um, approach to this. And, you know, it was so interesting when you had the, did you all see the thing with the brain scans and so on? And what's so interesting is when Bob talks, there's no light, there's no brain scans. <laughs> just teasing, Bob. Um, all right, so let me just make two or three quick responses to some of the points that Bob made, and then we can maybe uh, have a discussion. Uh, the first, I think, most important point I'd like to make to you about the 20th century that, that we've all just lived through is this, that I would make the case to you that the most enduring lesson of the last 100 years was this simple but profound message. Communism, socialism, or whatever you want to call it, whatever ism you want to call it, has been a failure everywhere it's been tried, and capitalism has been virtually a success. And I would make the case that that really is the most important lesson of the last 100 years. We saw what happened in the Soviet Union. We saw what happened behind the Iron Curtain where they were gonna create a worker's paradise for people by equalizing income and providing all of these government benefits and so on, and it didn't work very well. We saw what happened in China where Mao uh, you know, starved to death tens of millions of his own people, and, and that country became abjectly poor as they tried the communist, socialist, uh, big government model. Uh, meanwhile, countries that moved in the other direction prospered. Um, countries like the United States and the UK, and uh, more slowly, but certainly t to some extent, countries like Mexico and others. And so I would make the case to you, why do we, since, since we all kind of understand instinctively that free market capitalism is the way to go, why are we so romanced by this idea of bigger government, that this is going to solve our economic problems? And I wanted to, if I may, I just wanted to show you one quick chart that I think is really important about um, the, this whole issue about freedom and 
Uh, this, this, is, this is it. And, and this is something we worked on a lot at the Heritage Foundation. And it basically is saying, where do people get rich? You know, what, what countries are rich? We looked at 150 major countries in the world. And, and what you find here is that economic freedom, which are things that I think, you know, for the most part, um, Robert Reich and I would agree on. Things like free trade, things like, you know, a, a low level of taxation, limited government, property rights, um, contractual law, things like that. This, the countries that have that economic freedom, they tend to get rich. And countries that have very little economic freedom, and those are countries like, you know, if you think about countries like North Korea and Zimbabwe and countries like Cuba and others like uh, of that nature, they have tended to be very poor. And the lesson here is that if you want to reduce inequality, and by the way, I'm not hung up on inequality. I, I, what I want to do is, is have a system that doesn't, you know, make rich people poor, but makes poor people rich. And sometimes we, we forget that. There's a big difference. You know, look, we could all take out, you know, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett in the, in the public square and hang them, and income inequality would be reduced, but I'm not so sure that would make much of us better off. The point is that countries, all countries in the world, including Mexico, should want to move in the right direction, move in the direction of more economic freedom, because that's the formula for economic success. The second point I want to make, which is related to what you said, Bob, about trade and technology. I, I have a little bit of a more optimistic view about this. Look, if you look at country, if you think that free trade and globalization is a problem, and you think that this is what's causing people to become poor in some areas, I would make the case I'm not so sure that that's true. In fact, what are the countries in the world that are completely isolated from globalization and free trade? Think of countries like North Korea, and think of countries like, um, you know, I was, uh, my niece is in, in, uh, in, in Zimbabwe, in the Peace Corps. I mean, this is a country that is dirt poor, um, you know, where they're really living a subsistence level in the 21st century, and they are not part of the global situation. And I would make the case, boy, if they could get part of globalization and get part of this technological revolution, they could get rich at a very quick pace. Third quick point. You know, if you look at the last, the, the 25 year period from around 1980 to around 2005, this is the period I call the era of Milton Friedman. You all, how many of you know who Milton Friedman is? Almost all of you probably do. Milton Friedman, in my mind, I don't know if Bob would agree with this, was one of the greatest economists of the 20th century. And, and Milton Friedman did believe in the free market. And, and that was a period, by the way, when Ronald Reagan was elected president in the United States and Margaret Thatcher in Britain and all over the world, countries became and nations became freer, including here in Mexico. And this was a period, and this is why I think people are too dour about where we are today. This was a period when more than one billion people across the planet um, were moved out of poverty. One billion people it was one of the greatest success stories in human history. And by the way, I left out two of the most important countries where that, where that, um, that alleviation of poverty happened, China and India, both of countries that moved in the right direction. I'm not saying that China and India are totally free today economically, but they certainly moved in that direction. And my point is that economic freedom is really the kind of goose that lays the golden eggs. And so when I hear you talking, Bob, about you know pulling back on some kind of some of these economic freedoms, that makes uh, that makes me very nervous. So you wanted me to ask Bob a question, and so let me kind of toss this out to you, Bob. Um, do you think that higher taxes and higher minimum wages and things like that are really going to solve the problems of the poor? Uh, I first of all, Steve. Uh, when you talk about freedom, and I'll get to your question in a minute, uh, how about freedom of people to be educated? How about freedom of people, uh, children not to be starving for, for good food? How about, mm -hmm. how about freedom uh, to get a good, uh, have, a, have good, uh, a, a good uh, health care mm -hmm. system behind you? Are these not important freedoms, and do these not lead to people to have a greater chance of fulfilling their true potential? Uh, the problem uh, with uh, the conservative view that it's all about the size of government is that you don't differentiate between government, certain kinds of government spending that are investments in people, like education, uh, and other kinds of government spending that may be uh, simply spending on uh, uh, subsidies to industry. Uh, do you disagree, Steve? Uh, now, when you say about taxes, I, 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 again, I don't think taxes are 
or, or high or low. I don't think the, the issue is how high the taxes should be. It's what the taxes are for. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that we should be spending taxes uh, to uh, uh, provide bailouts to Wall Street, for well, example. Well, that's something that Bob and I uh, agree on, actually. Well, but, <laughs> this is one of the areas of agreement. Look, well, but, I am no, against no, crony but, but capitalism, is, but, and I agree with you on this but, stuff, But Bob. this is important. Yeah. Uh, I do think we ought to raise taxes on the wealthy to ensure a first-class educational system for all of our children. So, yeah, no, look, I, I certainly agree with, with Robert Reich that human capital, the development of your people, and the, and the knowledge and know-how of, of your people is, is one of the most important assets any country has, whether it's the United States or Mexico. So I'm with you on that. I want a top quality education for every American and every Mexican. But that doesn't mean you want to strangle the, the businesses that create the jobs. I mean, my goodness, when Hillary Clinton said, you know, I don't know how many followed this two weeks ago, that businesses and corporations don't create jobs. Oh, yes, they do. I mean, where else do jobs come from? What I'm saying is we can have the kinds of public investments that you're talking about, good roads, good hospitals, good schools, but, but let's also not Let's not strangle the, the, the private sector, the people who create the wealth in the first place. And that's why when people like Thomas Piketty, and I want to ask you this question, if I may, uh, Bob. You know, the, Thomas Piketty has this new book out that's become a big bestseller. And he argues that, you know, countries can have tax rates as high as 70 and 80 percent. I think that is absolutely asinine. But I wonder, do you, would you actually endorse something like that? Well, I, <laughs> I would say let's go back to the tax rates that we had, if we're talking about the United States, in the 19, between 1946 and 1981, in which the highest marginal tax rate, and those were great years by, the, the United States grew faster every year between 1946 and 1981 than it has grown since 1981. And by the way, the lowest marginal tax rate on the very rich during those 30 years was 70%. Under President Dwight D. Eisenhower in the 1950s, who was a Republican, uh, the highest marginal tax rate on the rich was 91%. Now, nobody accused Dwight Eisenhower of being a socialist, Steve. Uh, what he did was pre uh, preside over major investments in education, uh, and not only primary and secondary education, but also uh, university, public university education. Uh, he presided over the building of the most important international inter interstate highway building program the United States has seen. Uh, we rebuilt uh, Japan, we rebuilt Europe. Uh, those are investments in the future. And the point I'm making is that there's nothing wrong with taxing businesses and very wealthy individuals to invest in the future. That is well, the kind of investment that every country needs to be made. I sort of cringe when I hear you say that, because I do think the lesson of the last 25 years certainly has been that tax rates matter. I mean, we had a big boom in growth under Ronald Reagan and the president you worked for, uh, Bill Clinton, in the United States when tax rates fell. They, tax rates have been falling all over the world, in fact, as you know, over the last you know, 25 years. And look at the inequality. It, well, but look, I mean, the point is, look what's happening in the United States of America today. We have major companies like Burger King, like Walgreens, like Pfizer, that are leaving the United States or threatening to leave because the tax rates have gotten so high. So when you talk about 70, 80, 90 percent tax rates, I, that makes me cringe because I think these companies will leave. There's an old saying in economics, if you tax something, you get less of it. And if you tax something less, you get more of it. Why? In, you talked a lot about investment, and we both agree that we need more investment in this country. Why do we want to raise tax rates on the investment that you and I both know are so important to our future economic health? Well, I th would say that let's lower tax rates on workers. In other words, if we want more jobs, more workers, let's lower tax rates on jobs. Let's lower Social Security taxes. Let's lower all of those kinds of taxes. But what do we want less of? Uh, we want less uh, pollution. Let's raise taxes on pollution. Okay. Uh, if we want uh, less uh, worker uh, injuries, let's raise taxes on companies that have more worker injuries. Uh, let's do exactly what you say, and we will uh, have a system that is more equitable and also where there is more investment. Let's raise taxes on Wall Street. I mean, do you think that Wall Street should be uh, uh, should be allowed to continue to uh, go the way that they have gone uh, since uh, certainly over the last 25 years, which is more and more risky investments, uh, the kind of investments that uh, have made the global economy into a casino uh, and wreak havoc 
uh, with the rest of the economy, with average working people, both in the United States, in Mexico, and every place else. That's, the Great Recession came directly out of Wall Street. So let's raise taxes on Wall Street. Well, I think you're, you're raising tech taxes on the people who invest in the small businesses and the medium-sized businesses and the big businesses. You know, you, there was so much you know, that I agreed with what you said, Bob, I mean, truly. Uh, it's not just human capital, though. It's physical capital. You know, if, there's no, if you, if you want to have a job, first you have to have an employer. And that employer has to go to these capital markets and get the money. I mean, you know, one of the things I'd say, because there's so many students here, which is really I love, one of the highest callings that, you, that I think you can have in life is go out and start your own business. How many of you want to start your own business at some point? I mean, a lot of you do. God bless you. It's one of the, the great things to be an employer. And the thing, the reason I sort of, you and I disagree a little bit on this is we want to nurture those people who want to create business. We want to make it easier for them to go out in the capital markets and get the, you know, the quarter million dollar loan that they can get so they can build the building, so they can, you know, have the computers and so on to put people to work. And it seems to me you want to punish those people. No, probably. quite the opposite. In fact, the best, uh, the best recipe for successful businesses is a large and prosperous and growing middle class. Absolutely. And poor. I agree. The more prosperous your population is, the more they are able to turn around and buy. Uh, the job creators are not the CEOs. The job creators are not the billionaires. The job creators are people, That's average true. working people with good jobs who are earning enough to go and buy. Well, but you need, you need somebody who has the courage to set out that shingle and create the job in the first place. I mean, and that's why, you know, that I said to these, especially these students here, I mean, you know, and when you're a small business owner, and, and I think you run a, a small business, I've run, run one myself, you're the last person who gets paid. You know, you don't get paid until everybody else gets paid. We need to, my point is, we need to celebrate the entrepreneur. And by the way, what is wrong with getting rich? I mean, that's why we start businesses, right? We want to get rich. Bob, what's wrong with getting rich? Look at, there's nothing wrong with getting rich. The question is, how much money do people at the top really need to have the incentives necessary to do what they, we want them to do? Uh, the chief executive officer, in the United States of the top 500 companies used to earn 40 years ago 20 times the average salary of the average worker. Mm -hmm. Today, the chief executive officer of the typical Fortune 500 company earns 290 times uh, the wages, the earnings of the typical worker. How much is enough, Steve? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's a very fair point, you know, and I look, as a shareholder, if, uh, look, I, my only point is when you see these, uh, as a shareholder, I always say, look, if you've got a CEO of a company like Fred Smith, who runs Federal Express, one of the great run companies, or, or the gentleman who's sponsoring this conference, uh, you know, I don't begrudge him making millions or billions of dollars if, if, they're perform if the company is performing for the shareholders and the workers. Where I think you and I would agree is that when these companies, co CEOs run these companies into the ground and they get these golden parachutes for tens of millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars, that's I think where we have to draw the line. But that's for the shareholders, not the government to no, dictate. But, but if, you want, if you want public services like we've been talking about. Andres, are you trying to get in here into this discussion? No, no, no. The, the, I want to know if Ricardo, would you like to make a question before we go to lunch, oh, please? Sure. Because Gladys, I think Gladys, yeah. they're touching a lot of oh, topics there, that there are involved with Yeah, so I guess so. I'm a billionaire. I'm qualified to <laughs> answer. No? How much is enough? Yeah. How much is enough to create a new company, to create new jobs, right. to make new investments, to take on new risks? How much is enough? Should I? Um, donate all my money and retire? Would that make us happier? Yeah. Some people think that if you uh, give away the immense riches that you pointed, uh, it will make a better world. It won't make any difference. Of course, you give it away, and then immediately a new process of accumulation starts taking place where some will have more than others. That is just natural. So obviously, uh, some people think that that is unfair. Or you know, I'll take the tiger mom approach. That's the way it is. <laughs> and it should be, because people should have an incentive to do things. Right. Now, people uh, 
who criticize you know, extremely rich people like me probably don't have the experience, but you cannot eat more, bad for your belly. <laughs> you cannot drink more, right. so bad for your mind. Uh, there's lots of things that are limited, number one. Number two, this wealth is really not, not, uh, not like you have it in your checkbook here and you pull it out. It's in the form of assets, right? And assets that if you sell, first you have to have somebody who'd be willing to buy them, then you have to pay a lot of taxes, and then what would you do with it? Now, you'd have to loan it to the government, because these days that's what you do, you know, at a ridiculous rate. So the whole concept of wealth is, is, is something that most people don't understand, because they don't have these amounts. But it, I can tell you, and sincerely I can tell you, it's about investment. Yep. Whatever we do with our money, I'm, I'm, I just sold a company yesterday for 2.5 billion. Now, if we get a, a tax hit, and instead of having 2.5, I get 500, I'm still going to invest it. Right. But you know what? The other remnant, that money, is gonna go into the government coffers and to no effect. And that is my real point. We're always talking about the income side of the government. We're not talking about the expensive side of the government. And you gentlemen mentioned some very good policies there, but you didn't touch about a key point, as Americans I have to remind you. You have this misnomer called the Defense Department. <laughs> it's not a Defense Department, it's the War Department. Mm -hmm. Waging war all over the damn world and spending trillions of thousands of millions of dollars, money that we can't even understand, on just bombing people somewhere else. Why don't you start cutting the war spending? <laughs> Please, just one minute for each of you. Please. Uh, first of all, I, I, I want to nominate you as head of the Defense Department. <laughs> war Department. <laughs> would, that, would that be okay? War, with the War Department, if you change the name, I'll take it. <laughs> and we'll, we'll do whatever we want. But if you can get defense spending down, and you can transfer it to education in the United States and health care, that would be great. I know. Uh, <laughs> in an and, efficient uh, way. Uh, and the other, the other quick point is that I, I, I really don't think that the issue is one of criticizing rich people. That's, that's really not what's going on here, and that, nobody should do that. Uh, everybody is in a system, and everybody's doing the best they can in that system. The real question is, how do we get two things? Number one, enough resources to ensure good education and good health care and good infrastructure for everyone. That's, where does it come from? Well, if you get into a society in which more and more of the income and wealth are going to the top, that's where you get the resources to do, it's just logic. Uh, the second point is that without a growing middle class, you don't have enough purchasing power to keep the economy going. And in the United States, one of our biggest problems now is that so much income and wealth are going to the top that the middle and the poor don't have enough purchasing power to basically get the economy out of first gear. Same thing in Europe. Uh, and to a lesser extent, Japan has its own problems with deflation. Uh, but those are the concrete issues. It has nothing to do with blame. So uh, how many, we were chatting a little bit earlier, how many employees did you say you have, something like 200,000? So, I mean, this, this is- 85,000. That's 85,000, I mean, that's an amazing feat for one person, right? To have created 85, I don't know if, if you, about you guys, but I, I mean, feel that incredible. we did create I mean, those were, jobs. You were a hero, and by the way, you're a hero, you probably, at the end of your life, you probably will give most of your money away, but your contribution is not giving your money away, it's making it and building these incredible businesses in the first place. Uh, that's the first point I wanted to make. The second point, just, I wanted to end this on a really optimistic point. You know, I give a lot of talks on college campuses, as, as Bob does, in the United States. This is my first trip to Mexico hey, in five I, years. I, I, but I, I, I'm not, I don't only give talks on college campuses. Okay, <laughs> right. well he gets a big paycheck. But my only point is, I notice kids at the United States University are dour, dire, everything's so terrible. I mean, the polar ice caps are melting. And I just wanna reinforce this point. This is the greatest moment on earth to have ever lived. 
I mean, you look at the incredible things that every, I mean, half of the people in this room, two thirds of you are, are on your laptops <laughs> right now. The things that we have today that people didn't have as recently as 25 years ago, laptops, computers, you know, uh, cell phones, all of this incredible technology. In the next 20 years, we're gonna see cures for cancer or multiple sclerosis and heart disease and Alzheimer's and, and AIDS. All this stuff is within our grasp and it's because of this incredible know-how and technological prowess and the fact that people go out there and build up businesses to make this world a better place. And my only point is, let's not tear those people down. We, we want to have more people be millionaires, not less. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Great. Just a very quick question to my professor. I think that here we have sharing something in common. All of us believe that we have to invest in education. That's a public good, in infrastructure. That we want to have a stronger middle class that the problem is not if you're rich or you're not rich. But I think that the big question that we're missing is who spends the money in the most efficient and intelligent way? Is the government? Mm -hmm. It's not only in what do you spend, if it is in the army. It's not only if it, you, you use it for weapons or for education. No, it's also how you use it. Yeah. And my, just to finish, Professor Rich, my big question for you is because of incentives, because of the bureaucracies, because of the transactional costs. The big question is, if I tax a person that is very productive and I give that money to the government, and the government is corrupted, has high transactional costs, have no incentives because those people that work there are not going to be there forever because they don't plan for the future, all those things are real. And that's the problem. Who spends better that money? And I do believe that we have to think about it because at the end, good intentions to take out of the rich and to, okay, give it to another company named government to spend it <laughs> is making everybody poorer. That's my point, but that's my question. Hello, Andres. You know, when you were in my class, I, I, I love the way you taught, by the way. Uh, I, well, I love the way you learned, but obviously, <laughs> obviously you did not learn a terribly important central lesson. And I'm going to give it to you again. Please. And I'm not going to be patronizing about it, but if you look at the economy as a free market over here and government over here, you are making a fundamental mistake because the free market does not exist in a state of nature. It is based on rules. Those rules come from legislators, from administrative agency and from courts. If you've got a corrupt system, your free market is not going to work. That's true. But that doesn't mean you... No, 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 no. no, no. This, is, this is terribly important. Uh, if we want to conquer, let's say, global warming, uh, you do it not through government controls. You do it through changing market incentives. Uh, through, for example, uh, a... Uh, a, a, a cap-and-trade cap system, uh, or you do it through uh, a carbon tax, or you do it... No, but we, however, agree. Hmm? we agree when, that, when the private sector create externalities, but just let me tell you, just very, uh, very, forget about corruption. Even without corruption, the incentives for the government, because of public choice theories that you taught me, yeah. the incentives are much more miserable in the government than in the private sector. And just to finish with this question, and in the other path of Peru, even if the, if the system is corrupted, sometimes the market to survive helps to create wealth. But at the end, you were my professor, you will always be my professor, and thank you very much. <laughs> Un aplauso para todos, por favor. Muchas gracias. I just want to share with you, hoy en la mañana este señor abre Estoy saliendo de mi cuarto y, a, y empuja la puerta y se mete a mi cuarto. Y le digo, what the hell, I'm sorry. Se equivocó, pensó que era el restaurante. Fue un gusto conocerte, like that in the morning. Thank you very much.